Good morning and welcome to worship at Manasquan Presbyterian Church. Welcome to our summer schedule. It, it seems like it's really quick. It feels like we just finished one service. We're starting another one. Uh, we just finished one service. Oh, we did. We just finished it a few minutes ago. Uh, the sad part about it is I can't get out and David and I can't get out and say hello to all of you. So uh, make sure you say hello to us after the service. And uh, just a reminder, our services in the summer are going to be 8 a.m., 9 a.m., and 10 a.m. So you must have all got the memo because you're here at 9 a.m. So uh, that's what's happening. Um, our Wednesday service, Simply Jesus, is at the beach. And we've had our first. So the entire month of July, we're going to be down at the beach, the south end of Spring Lake on Brown Avenue. And last Wednesday was a wonderful service. It was an absolutely wonderful time. For those of you that were there, you know how great it was. It was, so it, cool. It was cool, and it was nice, and there were no, there were no gnats. I, yeah, there were no gnats or bugs. It was just wonderful and beautiful. So come on out this coming Wednesday for Simply Jesus. That's at 630 at the south end of Spring Lake Beach. Um, I want to share some sad news with you, and that is that uh, Todd Breland, who's been with us for 15 years, is moving to Massachusetts to become a farmer. Todd, you're up there. You can wave at everybody. They're clapping at your farming expertise and not the fact that you're leaving, because we're very sad that you're going to be leaving us, and, uh, but uh, we're going to celebrate Todd, and his last day will be August 1st. We will have a celebration for Todd after our final service on that day, up in our fellowship hall, so we hope that all of you can come and attend, and, and uh, we'll send Todd and his family on with our blessings through that. I invite us now to uh, prepare for our time of worship this morning as we listen to our prelude. stand together for our call to worship this morning. Our call to worship is a unison prayer, so we pray this along with me. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Come, let us worship our God. Our first song this morning is the church's one foundation.
Isn't it great to have Jan and the organ back? Come on. The Lord calls us to receive the forgiveness that he wants so much to give to us. And so let us together share our prayer of confession this morning as individuals and as the body of Christ. Together, let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And Jesus promises us that when we confess our sin, that he will forgive us, that he will set us free, and he will give us the peace and the joy and the love that he wants so much to give us. In his name, in his power, in his love, we are forgiven, we are redeemed, we are his children. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You, you, oh, I get oh. Oh. Amen. And I invite you to be seated. I also invite you into a time to continue to worship God as we give our tithe and offerings. And uh, for our offertory today, Pastor David Cotton is going to be singing a song for us. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, let us worship God as we give back to him who has given us so much, especially life and new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Step I may see his eyes. 
Our God, we thank you that you've gathered us together and called us into worship here. We're gathered around your word to hear your word, to proclaim your eternal word, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Take these gifts that we have given to you and use them so that we may go forward, continuing that same ministry that Christ had to proclaim you, to give glory to you, our God. Use these gifts so that where we have experienced new life in Christ Jesus, others may come to experience that same new life in Him. May we always go forward as your church, proclaiming you and giving glory to you, and proclaiming you so that others may come to know you as we know you too, especially through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And it is in His name we pray, and we pray together, saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the grace. For warmed up. Sorry about you guys in the front row. No, no. I love duct tape, and I am not afraid to admit it. In fact, I believe that with duct tape and WD-40, you can solve any problem. If it doesn't move, and it should, WD-40. Come on. And if it moves, and it shouldn't, duct tape. My family makes fun of me about how much I like duct tape because I think it's kind of the solution for everything. I looked up all kinds of stuff. You know, one of the things, if, 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 you're, if you have really bad bleeding before you can get to the hospital, you can use duct tape to stop the bleeding. I mean, it's, it's amazing stuff. And do you know that it comes in a bunch of different colors? It comes in a lot of colors and you can use it for a lot of things. This is a duct tape prom dress. A duct tape prom dress. Now, why would anyone, why would any self-respecting young teenage girl make a dress out of duct tape? There's a $10,000 scholarship every year for the girl and the guy who make the best duct tape prom outfit and wear it to the prom. $10,000 scholarship. Do you like duct tape now? But they really stopped making fun of me and my family about that. They make fun of me about all kinds of other stuff, but they stopped making fun of me about duct tape when I told them that duct tape is standard equipment on the space shuttle. And on one occasion, it saved their mission, and on another occasion, it saved their lives. It saved their mission when one of them dropped a wrench onto the fender of the lunar rover and broke it off. And the, the, the soil, the, the, the ground on the moon is very gritty, like, like volcanic soil. You know, it, it's not soft, it's gritty. And they were, they were concerned that if they drove the, the lunar rover, which stays there, and all of that dust was kicked up, it would get into the mechanisms and ruin the rover. And so they took a map. Remember those? Huh? If you don't ask somebody my age, all right? They took maps and duct tape and fixed the fender and saved the mission. And on Apollo 13, two of their oxygen canisters went bad, and they didn't have enough oxygen left without scrubbing the air that they were breathing out and taking off the CO2. And so they MacGyvered together this contraption to 
filter the CO2 out of the air so that they could survive, because they did the math and they wouldn't have survived. And one of the major components of this contraption was duct tape. So it's nothing to be laughed at. There's nothing better at holding things together than duct tape. Or is there? We watch those shows on TV, you know? He said he was innocent, but was he? Well, there's nothing better than duct tape, or is there? And yes, there is. And so I want to share that with you today, all right? So hear the word of, of God. The sun is the image of the invisible God. We don't know what God looks like. God is spirit. God doesn't have a form, but God sent his son. He, God, God came in a human body so that we could understand more about God. God already understands about us and still loves us, but we don't understand about God. So he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created. How cool is that? In Jesus, everything was created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, it doesn't matter how important things people think they are and things think they are on this earth, they were all created by Jesus. All things have been created through him and for him. And here we go. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Jesus is the ultimate at holding things together, at bringing things together that are separated, and in keeping them together. People and relationships and, and everything that you can think of, Jesus is that great reconciler that brings things together. In Jesus, all things hold together. Is it any wonder that so much in our world is coming apart these days? Because Jesus is the one that holds it all together. We continue with the same scripture. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. He's the firstborn from among the dead. Then we're, we follow. He's the first one to defeat death with his resurrection. And we get to celebrate and live in that victory and turn death, the sting and the, and the pain of death, into the promise and the, 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 just the hope and the, and the joy of resurrection so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. How cool is that? That God the Father said, everything that's in me is in him. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things. Through Jesus, to reconcile to himself everything. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, all of it, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus is the great reconciler. And I thought, let me just kind of take a look at what the, the definitions of reconcile are. Because if Jesus is the great reconciler, the great bringing things together, let's see what reconcile means to us. And so I looked it up, and the very first definition was to restore a relationship. To reconcile is to bring two people, two groups, back together again when they've been separate. The next de definition of reconcile is to cause to be in harmony, to be compatible, to, to work together, to be at peace with one another, to, to, to function together, to want to be together. And the third one, if you ha had to take accounting or if you're an accountant, you know what reconciling two columns of figures is, right? You take the column over here and you take the column over here and you have to add what you need to add or subtract what you need to, you need to find where the discrepancies are and take care of those discrepancies so that those two columns match. And that's what Jesus does for us. He finds the places where there are errors and brings us together. Jesus is the great reconciler. And as followers of Jesus, he calls us to be reconciled to one another. He calls us to be reconcilers too. So how does he do that? I wanna, if I want to be a reconciler, and follow Jesus. If I want to bring things together and hold things together, and Jesus is the model for that, how did he do it? Well, there are a couple of ways. The first way was through sacrifice. Listen to what Paul says to the Romans. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And then he kind of 
goes off a little bit on a tangent and says, well, you know, very rarely would anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. And then he gets back to the point again. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The way of the world is to say, well, when you get your act together, when you clean things up, when you get it right, when everything is okay, then come back and we'll work it out. Not Jesus. That's not the Jesus way. Jesus died for me in my sins, not after I got my life together. He died for me as a sinner and you as a sinner. He didn't wait for us to get it right. He made it right. He, brought a, he came first. His sacrifice made it possible for us to come back together to him, back together with God. Jesus reconciles us to God through his death on the cross. Have you seen the, the, the diagram where there's this big chasm like the Grand Canyon and there's the holy God over here and there's humans in their sinfulness and humanness and the only thing that connects them, the only thing that reconciles them, the only thing that brings them together is Jesus stretching out his arms on the cross and bringing us back together, being the bridge from us in our humanness and sinfulness to God in God's holiness. That's how Jesus reconciles us to God. And that's why Jesus asks us to be reconcilers for one another. Through sacrifice first. We have to be willing to make the move, to make the sacrifice. Not to wait for the sacrifice from somebody else or something else. Number two, Jesus reconciles through service. Jesus called them together. Take a look up here for a minute. The disciples were guys. And you put 12 women in a room with a job to do, and they're going to figure out how to do it together and how to cooperate. Put 12 guys in a room, and the first thing we're going to do is decide who's number one through 12. And I know that's a generalization, but come on, guys. Come on, ladies. I know I can get a head nod from you. Because we love to compete, and we love to know who's first. And the disciples are walking along, talking about who's going to be the greatest, who's going to be one through 12. And they stop for the evening, and... Jesus calls them together and he says, uh, what are you guys talking about back there? And they all looked at their sandals, you know, because they knew that that's not what he would say. And so he calls them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them because they had the Romans in their country and nothing was more hierarchical than the Roman structure and nothing was more, you just obey the person above you, whatever he says to do, you do it. So they had that pattern. And he says, that's what they do. Not so with you. I'm sure he pointed his finger at them. My mother was a great finger pointer. She was about five foot nothing, all right? But she had a great finger, all right? And you feared the finger from my mom because then it was really important and you were in trouble if you didn't do it. And I'm sure he pointed his finger and said, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, I didn't come to have you serve me, to be the Lord and master and, and bow down and do what I say because I said so, that's why. Jesus is the one who washed their feet when he knew they were going to betray him. He knew they were going to desert him. They knew, he knew that they were going to all disappear when he needed them. But he served them. The last shall be first. I'm always the troublemaker at Ocean Grove. I'm a, I'm a trustee for the moment. We had this donor dinner yesterday and I went to it and did my part as a trustee, and, and they had table games at the tables, and, uh, uh, and then they, they said, pick one person from each table, and they had two of those blow-up things, and they had uh, skee ball and axe throwing. Not real axes. Don't ever get near me with anything that's sharp, because, you know. And so I was the one who had to represent our table for the axe throwing. I say had to because no one else would do it. And so um, and they added up the scores of the two things, and the table with the highest score was going to get a prize. And so I went up to the person who runs the thing, and the person who runs the thing is someone that nobody messes with, except me. And I said, why don't we do this the Jesus way? 
and have the table with the lowest score get the prize. From Mars. Like I was speaking a different language from a different planet. But that's the way Jesus would do it. Jesus says, if you want to be first, try serving. There's something that happens when you serve people. I had the, the blessing of having my mother-in-law live with us for the last two and a half years of her life. And, and I like my mother-in-law. I mean, I liked her before she moved in. I'm not one of those who tells mother-in-law jokes. But being able to have her in my house and being able to serve her and care for her. It formed this bond between us that's so much sweeter and so much more beautiful than it ever was before. And it was good before. When you have the opportunity and the joy of serving somebody, it connects you and combines you and reconciles you in a way that nothing else can. Service is one of the ways that we can be reconcilers to serve one another. But most of all, Jesus calls us to be reconcilers, and reconciliation begins with forgiveness. That's the start of reconciliation. That's the first step toward reconciliation. And Jesus was the model for us. Two other men, both criminals, were led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus looks out at the people who trumped up the charges, who had an illegal trial in the middle of the night when the trials were only supposed to be during the day according to the Jewish law that they loved so much, and then put him to death and released a criminal. He looks at them and says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. That is the ultimate in forgiveness as far as I can understand. But Jesus cleared his soul cleared his, he, he found peace in that. And he set an example for us that there's nothing beyond his forgiveness, so there should be nothing beyond ours. Reconciliation begins with forgiveness. I'm, oh, so look up here for a second. In the Jewish faith, religious Jews in the first century, there was nothing absolutely nothing more important than at least once a year going to the temple and presenting a, a sacrifice at the altar so that your sins could be forgiven. It was the one thing that you had to do in order to be right with Yahweh. Except Jesus says, you know what? There's something equally, if not more important than that. I wanted to give you that context because I want you to know what a bombshell this was, and we don't understand it unless we understand the context, okay? So there's the one thing that's most important to be a good Jew, and Jesus says this. If you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, not you have something against them, but they have something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, and everybody's saying, what? Leave your gift. That's the most important thing you can do. You have to be right vertically with God. And Jesus says, no. Leave your gift and first go and be reconciled to them. And then come and offer your gift. So Jesus takes a vertical faith and makes it horizontal too. Jesus takes the vertical part of the cross and adds the horizontal and says, you know what's equally, if not more important than being right with God? You know what God wants from you and me and all of us? To be right with one another. To do that first. Forgiveness comes first. I think forgiveness is the start of reconciliation. But I think, unfortunately, forgiveness is one of the most misunderstood tenets of Christianity because it's gotten popularized. It's gotten psychology todayized. All right? Everybody's on TV talking about forgiveness and they, they, don't, they don't have any Christian fundamental background. So I want to talk to you about what forgiveness is in the, in the eyes of Jesus, what it is and what it isn't. First of all, forgiveness is one way. You don't wait for the other person to say, I'm sorry. You don't wait for the other party to say, I was wrong. You don't wait for them to ask for forgiveness. 
You do it one way. One way. I don't like to do too much Greek lesson with you, but I think it's important and, and instructive in this area because the Greek word that we translate as forgiveness in its immediate, literal sense means to leave it behind. If you went home and realized that you left your cell phone here on the pew, it's that word. It says, just leave it behind. Just let it go. Leave it back there. It was back there. Don't take it with you. Don't put it, that load on your heart and your soul and your life and your relationships and your peace and your joy and your love. Don't load it down with stuff that was back there. Leave it back there. And my understanding of forgiveness is that it starts when we realize and accept that we can't change the past. Wouldn't you love to change the past? I'd love to change some stuff that I did and some stuff that I didn't. But for a good part of my life, I wanted to change my dad. It just wasn't good between us. He wasn't the dad that I wanted. He wasn't the dad that I needed. And it was a little more complicated because he wasn't my biological dad, which is a piece of it, like it or not. But then at some point, God knocked me upside the head with the heavenly two-by-four that he uses to get my attention and said, you know, you can't change that. You can love him for who he is and what he is. You can understand that he did the best he could with the tools he had. And you can move forward or you can stay in that place of resentment and, and anger. And it was, it was, it opened the door you know what happened within a year after I did that whole forgiveness thing with my dad? Jesus said, now you can become a minister. Because I, I was carrying all that stuff and expecting him to be something he could be and being holier than him and thou and holier than Jesus because Jesus forgave him. It means leaving that hurt behind and it means try, stop trying to change the past. Forgiveness is something that we do to unburden ourselves, to open ourselves up to the love and the joy and the peace and everything that Jesus wants to give us that gets all stopped up because we won't forgive. Forgiveness is the one way. What is, forg what is forgiveness not? This is some of the popular stuff that's out there. Forgiveness is not having to say or having to believe that what happened didn't hurt. You don't ever have to get to a point where you say, well, I guess that was okay. No, it wasn't okay, but it was then, and this is now. Yes, it did hurt, but I'm leaving it behind. Yes, it did happen. It happened the way I thought it happened. It happened the way I experienced it happening. And I don't have to pretend, and I don't have to tell lies to myself and to everybody else and say that it was okay. All I have to do is leave it behind and let it be back there. And forgiveness is not putting yourself in a position to be hurt again. And that's some of the popular stuff that's out there. That if you forgive someone, you have to put yourself back in connection with them, and no, you don't. It means to leave it behind, but it doesn't mean to go backwards. Amen? Head nod? All right, I want everybody to understand that. Forgiveness, it's the start of reconciliation. So reconciliation's the goal, but sometimes reconciliation is not possible. Because look, look up here. Forgiveness is you moving one way, right? Reconciliation is this. Both parties moving. Both parties coming to the middle. Both parties saying, I'm sorry. Both people wanting to come together. That may not be possible. And God does not call us to do the impossible, but God calls us to do what we can do. In as much as it depends on you, the scripture said. Be at peace with everyone. What depends on us? The one-way move. Sometimes the other move doesn't ever happen. But what can we do? Well, our, our calling is to follow Jesus and to forgive first, to be the first one to forgive, not to wait for the other, and to welcome the healing and the comfort and the peace of soul, mind, and heart 
set free by the love of the Savior, and to keep praying for reconciliation. I'm still praying for reconciliation with a member of my family of origin. It's not working. <laughs> it hasn't worked yet, but I'm still praying for it, and I've done the forgiveness things that I need to do. But don't, don't think that because you don't achieve reconciliation that you've done something wrong. You've done what God calls you to do. But our blessing is being reconciled to God through the sacrifice and the service and the forgiveness of Jesus. Remember, Jesus has done it first. He's loved us. He's sacrificed for us. He's served us. He's forgiven us. And he calls us to do the same. And when we do, we can find peace. And if everything works, we can find reconciliation. But the love of Christ and his forgiveness is better than duct tape. Trust me. Amen. I invite you to join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the word that we've gathered around that Pastor David has preached. We give you thanks for the word of life. May we take this word into our hearts now and take it out into the world where we put it into practice. Our God, we thank you for all of the many celebrations in life. We thank you for the celebration of Arlene and Bill Rathjen as they celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary. We also lift up to you prayers of intercession. We pray that you be with the family of Doug Anderson, of John Belding, of Bill Guide, Grace and Frith. We pray that you be with Donald Thompson. Be with all these that we have named and all those that are unnamed. Our God, we lift up to you in our prayers those that you've placed in our hearts, and silently we pray for them together right now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you hear our prayers, that we can call upon you in an intimate way as Jesus called upon you, Abba, meaning Daddy. You are our Father that cares for us. May we see this great care that you have for us and bring our cares and concerns to you. And we thank you for your providence in our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Before we sing our next hymn, I just want to say thank you to the church family, especially thank you for all of the prayers that you have for the many people that are in our church body as we continue in prayer. Thank you to our prayer team that meets every week and offers prayers for those that need them. Uh, we want to specifically on this day give thanks to God for the prayers answered for Doug Anderson. So Doug is home now. So Betty is right back there. Betty is Doug's mother. Doug is home after 100 days in rehab, 50 days in ICU, and he still has some way to go, so continue to keep that family and all the other families in prayer as we just lift him up to uh, God and God's care, but we want to, on behalf of the Anderson family, uh, thank you for your prayers and your concerns for Doug and for Doug's family. Let us now stand and sing our closing hymn. My hope is built on nothing less.
We invite you to join us at the beach on Wednesday at 6.30 uh, for our beach service. I guarantee you it won't be sinking sand. Uh, and so uh, we'd love to see you there. The Lord watch over you as your days increase. Bless and guide you wherever you may be. Strengthen you when you stand. Comfort you when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise you up if you fall. And finally, in your hearts, may the peace that passes understanding abide all the days of your life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.